bevo.com. One of the greatest business minds in the world, one of the coolest people in the world, Tom Peters, welcome to Bevo. Thank you very much. With an introduction like that, there's nowhere to go but down. <laughs> cool guy, business you. mind. Yeah, it's been a lovely interview. Can we send a copy to my mom? Tom, Bob Waterman, the co-author of In Search of Excellence, said once, and I'll quote, Tom's not happy unless he's madder than hell about something. So is there anything that you're madder than hell about right now? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it a slightly different angle and then come back. Uh, there have been books, obviously, libraries full of books uh, written about the topic of innovation and where you get ideas and so on and so forth. I sincerely believe there is one and only one source of innovation and it's pissed off people. You know, Branson disgusted with BA's quality customer service says let's make flying fun and he's done the same thing in financial services and so on and whether it's a tiny change in a business process by a 29-year-old purchasing person or Branson level stuff, it's because they won't, can't deal with the status quo. And you know, obviously that has pragmatic uh, uh, implications in terms of the people you hire and the misfits who you uh, allow yourself to retain uh, until the point occasionally where it goes too far. It did for, with Steve Jobs actually for a while. But uh, latest rants, uh, latest rants translation thereof is earliest rants. Uh, at some level, I think, and I think many of us do this, if you've had some success as a professional uh, and you're curious, you dig deeper and deeper and deeper into a topic until whatever it was that was significant in the first place becomes unrecognizable. Tom, in your book, uh, Reimagine, you, um, you've got a great chapter in here which is talking about uh, the 50 great attributes of world-class leaders and the attributes that all those leaders have. So, but there's some interesting ones in there, like for example, they have a tendency to hang out with freaks, which I find personally reassuring. But maybe you could just, if you can, Tom, elaborate uh, just on some of these, um, these ones. So maybe we can start with leaders are rarely the best performers. It, it goes back to an earlier question. It's what a sports team understands. That, that the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, and the end of the day, you are as good as your talent. Uh, if you are a boss, you are not paid to be the best salesman, the best accountant, or what have you. You are paid to develop the best salesman, the best accountant, which we know in sport or the movies. Nobody said the director is supposed to be the best actor. We said the director is, is, is paid to be able to deal with these crazy personalities that typically they bring. And I think the same thing, again, is true in an accounting department where I want cool people doing interesting things. I mean, it's another topic. I believe that R&D is as important a word in accounting, logistics, and HR as it is in new product development. But that's another point. That's cool. And what, what about uh, leaders are dealers in hope? I put it in a, in a slightly different way once. I said leaders are responsible for painting portraits of excellence. There's a, I think it's a Coleridge quote, but there's a quote that says something along the lines, there's nothing so contagious as enthusiasm. I really will draw the line in the sand on this one. You do not want a leader who is not enthusiastic, period. Uh, and I happen to believe, which is not exactly news, that you can probably help people with anything, but you can't train enthusiasm. Got to find it. And our dearly beloved friends in the HR department have got to bite their tongue and put it at the top of the list of traits for everybody. Housekeeper in the hotel. I mean, it's the person running the accounting department because the role of a fabulous accountant is to help people, to help the other departments they support. Uh, no enthusiasm, no hire. You know, even if you graduated first in your class, ah, I'm being a little too extreme. You know, in microbiology, I'm willing to take a dreary person who's you know, 23 and clearly going to win the next Nobel Prize. I, right. I will acknowledge like exceptions that. to every rule. <laughs> and Tom, what about this one where it says uh, leaders have a tendency to be angry? Angry, yes. 
the, the, Warren Bennis, who is the guru of gurus in leadership, in my opinion, and one of the rare people who actually deserves that title, uh, you know, he, he, he says, and I think he's probably right, he is about so many things, he said nobody wants to be a leader per se, but you have such a compelling need to express yourself. You know, I'm not sure Churchill at 65 or whatever it was wanted to go through the hassle of being a prime minister, even though politics was life. Uh, but he had a point of view, and he was pissed off for the future of this great nation. And, uh, and, I, and again, I think the same thing is as true for the person who takes over, well, for, I've used this example before, for the Richard, Ver Richard Branson, who, you know, who fundamentally says, why isn't flying in an airplane fun? It ought to be. And, and that's fury, anger, enthusiasm all mixed together, but it's all these soft factors. Tom, uh, <clears throat> leaders are great storytellers. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there is no question whatsoever that this is probably number one or number two on the list of, of political leadership skills. Prime ministers and presidents induce people to change things by telling stories. It is said that, and I don't remember this one, uh, but it is said that one of the keys that Reagan used, and he was influential, like him or not, relative to the ending of the Cold War, was he told this wonderful story about, you know, the grandchildren, you know, my grandchild, Harry, and your grandchild, whatever, I don't know many Russian names, and, and he riffed off of, the, you know, he's a great riffer to begin with, but, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was writing an introduction writing the editing, the introduction to a book that I've got coming out in a few months before we began, you know, began this interview. And I said, you know, I said, I'm trained as an engineer, I have an MBA, and I worked at McKinsey, but I really believe that the answer to all life's problems is a really good or good small story that illustrates a big point. And I had just written a little thing about a clean loo in a little restaurant in a small town. And I said, that's experience marketing. Uh, you know, and I'm delighted to have the term experience marketing because I think words are critically important. But you don't illustrate it with charts and graphs showing how many gallons of green paint Starbucks used. It's a little story of Howard Schultz tripping over an idea you know, on a visit to Inner Mongolia and translating it into a yet another advantage for Starbucks. They hang out with freaks. For senior people in big corporations, exposing yourself to variety is probably literally number one. And the world is changing, it's always changing, it's changing for every part of the organization, and you've somehow or other got to expose yourself to new stuff, wild stuff, crazy stuff. And, you know, I was, when I first went to work for McKinsey, I had an absolutely fabulous boss who was like this. And he had a lot of chutzpah as well. He would read an article in a journal somewhere, and it would be a cool article about something. And he was very mathematical. But he'd read an article, and he'd call the guy, and he would say, I see you're at Northwestern. I'm going to be in Chicago three weeks from now. Can we have lunch? But he almost always translated it into action. And so... Again, I think it's, I mean, the, the, the uh, I know, I'm, you know, I love statistics, and so I know I use this term standard deviation too much, but the deviation from the norm of the number of the people you go to lunch with in the course of any month is horrifyingly small for most of us. And the wonderful news is you like your workmates. The bad news is you go to lunch with the person you really like a lot who you've gone to lunch with 37 times in the last three months, uh, lovely lunch, ain't going to learn anything new. Uh, again, partially, but not wholly, it is recruitable. I mean, there's a, there's a guy who wrote a book, I forgot, it was called Who, W-H-O, Who, and he said the single most significant thing that any enterprise does is the hiring decision, and almost none of us take it seriously enough. Uh, meaning, I think I can help people. Well, there's a guy who runs, who runs leadership development at Google, I think, who says, 
I can't train good leaders. I can help pretty good leaders become a lot better. And I think an awful lot of these traits, I'm, I've, I've got a, you know, in my scientific bias sets, uh, I think, you know, I agree with Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, 10,000 hours of practice are necessary, but if you can't carry a tune, 10,000 hours of practice probably aren't going to take you to Carnegie Hall. And so you got, you know, the, the, the genetic part helps. I have a gregarious mother. It helped, believe me. That's right. 10,000 hours of vocal training is nothing <laughs> going right. to do anything for Absolutely. me on the, in the yeah. choir. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom, what exactly do you mean when you say leaders break down barriers? I talk a lot, I write a lot, I write a lot more about today than ever before about barriers between functions. And I argue they're the number one problem associated with implementation. Uh, I, 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 I gave the boss a title and something I wrote one time and I called him the CHRO, Chief Hurdle Removal Officer. Uh, I'm not supposed to do the work for you, but I can really add value if I can take a little hurdle that looks to me, even though I'm not exalted, I'm just a first line, it, to me it looks this high, to you it looks that high. And just get some little bureaucratic impediment out of your way. Uh, I can call the guy, you know, you need an office for four guys who are working on your project. Uh, the best thing I can do for you is I happen to know the number two person in the facilities office and I call him up and I say, come on, Harry, don't take four, four weeks to get this thing done. My guys need a little office. Can you get them one by next week or can you get her one by this afternoon? I can take that project and, and, and make it a phenomenally more efficient by, I mean, you know, life is not easy, business is an art. At some level, people need to learn how to get around barriers like that, no issue. On the other hand, I, I, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, point being that you can have the greatest systems in the world, greatest software, greatest people, shit still happens. And uh, you know, it's like a friend of mine who relative to the, you know, the, in this world where we have terrorism, et cetera, we can spend infinite amounts of money uh, on trying to find these SOBs before they hit us. But we also have to say, going to happen, and the money has got to be poured into the rapid response. You know, in the in the same fashion, if you were if you were a uh, a six sigma quality person, you would say, make the police system perfect. Let's not worry about what happens because it shouldn't happen. Right. If you're a prime minister, or president, you say, going to happen, even though I can't say it in the public speech we got to be ready to deal with it. And what about leaders are part of the action faction? Bizarrely enough, and I actually think this is relatively true, uh, the former vice chairman of GE worked for Welsh, Larry Bossidy, went on to run Allied and so on, wrote a book two or three years ago called Execution. I am in love with the book and I really haven't read it. <laughs> Not true, uh, but somewhat true. And I love it because, you know, in a world where there are 7,000 books on marketing and 7,000 books on finance, it may be the first serious book that had a title called Execution. And, you know, Bossidy says fundamentally you spend 90% of your time removing hurdles and focusing people on getting stuff done as opposed to 90% of your time focusing on the strategy. And so, you know, I, I had two commanding officers doing my, during my two tours of duty as a combat engineer in Vietnam. And uh, one of them, who I really learned this from, you know, basically said, Peters, your job is to build the damn things. I don't want reports on it, I want it built. There may be a monsoon, people may be shooting at you, you're being paid your $3,000 a year as a second lieutenant or ensign in the Navy to build. And then my second commanding officer I barely exaggerate when I say he would rather have had a tidy report about something that was never finished than something that was finished but the paperwork was lousy. And de facto, if not de jure, an awful lot of that goes on in business of the public sector, certainly in the private sector as well. 
and relative to my bias towards small and medium-sized companies, uh, huge amounts of bureaucracy seep in to the 10-person company by the time it becomes a 50-person company. You've got to get organized, but you can't let it strangle you. Yeah, this one's a good one because I, I know that a lot of leaders like to think, hey, they've escaped the sales department, but you say that leaders are salespeople extraordinaire. Every human being who succeeds, even at a technical discipline, is a good salesperson. All of life is sales. It sales to your nine-year-old, literally, when you're trying to make a point. It is sales to 300 million people. Well, let's say 200 million adults if you're Barack Obama trying to change the health care system in the United States. It's sales if you are a narrow-minded PhD in engineering who really would like to see people implement that shockingly cool idea that you have. The, you know, I had this wonderful little experience. I'd never heard it so clearly. Uh, my wife and I were on vacation in New Zealand and we were at a, you know, at an old sheep station that was now partially resort. And there was this guy, I would guess he was about 65, and he had been a, I don't think it's appropriate to mention his name, but he'd been a very successful television producer in Hollywood. And God knows we weren't talking about managing, we were just talking about, we were bullying, frankly. And he said, which was subsequently proved, he said, I had all these fabulous ideas. He said, and I just couldn't get them approved. And it was really making me angry at how stupid the people were who I was going to. And he said, I happened to have an insomniac night, and I was watching television at say two o'clock in the morning, and I watched one of these how to make a million dollars in real estate programs, and it was really stupid, except some of the tools weren't bad. He said, I invested two years in my life. He said, I must have bought 60 books on selling. He said, I went to some of those real estate conferences, and he said, I taught myself to be a good salesman. And as a result thereof, the good things that have happened to me came directly from that. But I thought that was kind of the best story I'd ever heard because, you know, again, and, and, and I, many leaders understand it if they, well, two things. Uh, many leaders understand it, even if they don't do it particularly well. The people who make me angry are the people who are in charge of systems in the IS department or the person who's running a six-person training department who said, I have a PhD in training. I know my stuff. I'm not paid to be a salesman. And you know, my bias is your PhD in training is relatively incidental if you're gonna make a mark. You know, if you ain't inter you know, if you ain't interested in sales, you ain't interested in getting things done. Period. The other point I wanted to make, and it's a huge part of this new book that, that I'm writing, is I believe that disciplines like sales, disciplines like listening, are as amenable to study, practice, and mastery as is playing the cello or learning to be a fly fisherman. And one of the huge problems with certainly MBAs, but you and me in general, is the stuff, you know, listening not for you, but you really are a freak in that dimension. It's what you do for a living. That's not fair because there are a lot of people who, do, who are doing what you're doing, who do it because they love to talk. You know, Chris Matthews, the political guy in the United States, has a program which fundamentally, I'm a foil. You know, he said, isn't that right, Tom? Four times in a half an hour. But, but it's, uh, you know, I was, when I was writing this book, and I'm a lousy listener. Uh, I was saying that. I said, you know, you really have got to be a professional listener. Which I, and so I went to Amazon, and I found 70 or 80 books on listening. I have a wonderful book title for a book I'm not going to write. And it really is good. Trust me, this is good. Two words. And the two words are listen, talk. Because obviously doesn't require graduation 
from the second grade, the two things that we do are listen and talk. Virtually nobody is trained in either one of them. And yet both of them are as practicable, learnable, masteryable as learning to, you know, sail a 12-meter uh, yacht or, you know, become a fly fisherman or become a neurosurgeon. And if you do what the average business person does, that's what you do. That's your cello playing. That's your fly fishing. That's your, uh, you know, your art. And, and we should, in, and again, I do believe in genetics. And, you know, maybe even the people who are the best sailors know the difference between a west wind and an east wind a little better than the average. But... You know, the, I mean, for heaven's sakes, if you think it's sport, you have the best athletes in the world, but what defines the winners from the losers at that high level? The practice and the quality thereof. And so uh, I, I, I want to professionalize the stuff that we really do. And the real stuff is relationships, and it's listening, and it's being able to present. A good friend of mine in senior management at a giant company says he spends 15 or 20 years developing a great person and that great person flunks out because he makes two consecutive lousy presentations, each of them four minutes long to the board. I mean, we had the world's most improbable president of the United States and he wouldn't be there if he hadn't made a 17-minute speech at the Democratic Convention in Boston in 2004. And, and, and interesting, because Obama is a good example and he's a good example I mean, he is, again, genetically, he's got a lovely temperament and he's got a brain probably to die for. He has trained, you know, I was reading something about how Obama constructed his personality. Uh, and, you know, brick by brick, stone by stone, board by board, he did. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it just infuriates me that, you know, one of, there, there are so many people who are so much smarter on this stuff and better than I am. And I would have read a lot of stuff, and it's become one of my latest passions, the art and science of apologizing, uh, which women may not need, but you and I need seriously. And so I became fascinated by it, and I go to Amazon, and there are 20 or 30 books on apologizing, on everything from Chernobyl to at home forgetting to take the garbage out. And they are written by leading philosophers from Oxford as well as self-help ninnies from God knows where. But, you know, it, 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 it is probably the best of the executive coaches. Is a, and I have problems with that discipline, but the good ones are good. Uh, Marshall Goldsmith says there's nothing more important in life than the ability to apologize with sincerity. My MBA course is going to have a whole course on apologizing, on appreciating and saying thank you, on listening, on presenting. And, uh, you know, there's the, the story I like to tell when I'm here, as opposed to seven other things when I'm in the U.S., is Edward VII was not supposed to be necessarily the brightest bulb in the, you know, in the closet, and he was not particularly respected uh, by your countrymen. Uh, and at a crucial moment, I think it was 1912 maybe, he goes over to France. He arrives in France, the French are out on the streets booing and hissing. Uh, Edward has the greatest 96 hours perhaps in the history of Britain. Uh, his French is gorgeous, his mastery of the language. He is a charming person. He goes to the opera, he goes to the ballet, he charms the dancers, he charms the actors, he's seen on the street. 96 hours later he leaves, and excuse my rotten French pronunciation, the Parisians are once again lined up on the street saying, Viva, viva notre roi, long live our king. Now that didn't 
changed the entire world at the moment, 12 months later, after hard work, the detente between the Brits and the French is signed, and therein lies the story of effectiveness in World War I. And you know, the, you know, the winning hand in World War I was a king who wasn't that bright and wasn't considered the best of the lot, who had 96 good hours in Paris and changed the world. And so why don't we teach Edward VII-ism as a course? And you know, I've, I've read a lot, uh, I give my left and right arms to meet him, on Mandela. Mandela is the same way. The, his 90th birthday, Time Magazine did a whole special issue and they had Mandela's, I think it was top five leadership traits. One of them was his smile. They said, no human being on earth, jailer or mate, can resist, you know, the mate will run through machine gun fire, the jailer will treat you with respect, and it comes from his smile. Now, I don't think I can teach a person who's never smiled how to smile, but I think I can help people or send them off to a coach to not to wave my arms around, not to wave their arms around like I do, which has its limitations, but to be a little bit more amateur animated to, you know, the, 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 the people who measure this stuff says you have, say you have seven seconds to make a first impression with somebody. I think you can work at the margin on that. Right. And these are the skills which, which leaders of nations and, you know, the, you know, Franklin Roosevelt famously once said, uh, the president has to be the nation's number one actor. And he, Orson Welles was the, uh, you know, the, the leading actor in the United States in Roosevelt's time. It's a wonderful story that's told. And Roosevelt meets Mr. Welles, and he, you know, however he did it, I guess Welles came around the table because of Roosevelt's infirmity, puts his on, arms around Welles, and he says, ah, Mr. Welles, Mr. Welles, America's two greatest actors finally meet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, you know, it's the, it's the, it's, it's true, but it's also true at a less extraordinary level for the 25-year-old supervisor with her first first-line supervisorial job who is attempting to help the people in her department become more vivacious, energetic, enthusiastic about whatever it is they're doing. So, and, and it applies to the 21-year-old fresh-caught engineer who has a good idea, who's a junior member of a project team who would like to have somebody helping. And you are in the sales, recruitment, and persuasion business as a 21-year-old engineering graduate at some level uh, as much as Mr. Blair or Mr. Clinton or, uh, you know, or Mr. Obama <laughs> said it. Tom, yeah, because one of your friends actually on TomPeters.com, Seth Godin, he talks about the fact that organizations and individuals need to be remarkable, i.e. that you're able to remark about them, so you stand out from the crowd. But in this noisy world of digital and social media, how is an organization or an individual supposed to stand out from the crowd? As you know, my message for a long time has been, and my real answer to your, to your CEO deal is, yeah. Uh, you know, whether, whether it's sport, whether it's uh, music, or whether it's a company, best roster of talent wins. But, but one, one of my great and happy days professionally is we do this list, and pretty much everybody does it, you all do it, of 100 best companies to work for uh, in the country or in a region or what have you. And the number one company a couple of years ago, which you haven't heard of, but neither of many Americans, is a regional grocer That's called awesome. Wegmans out of Rochester. And what I loved about these guys is, you know, when you're talking about the people stuff, I will get somebody who comes up to me, whether it's Malaysia, whether it's the UK, or whether it's Chicago, and they will say, fine, you talk about all these people practices, you lived in Silicon Valley for 30 years, you can do this at Oracle, you can do it at Google, but I'm in retail. Well, you know, stuff it there's Wegmans, and so you can do it in a regional retailer. And relative to these nasty times we are in right now, actually the first retailer, I think, to be the number one company to work for in America 
was a couple of years before Wegmans, and it's a little kind of a sort of American version of IKEA called the Container Store. And the reason for bringing them up is while everybody else amongst their competitors and pretty much the world in the face of this retail horror of the last year or so was cutting stuff across the board, the Container Store doubled their training expenditure for in-store personnel because their comment was, the CEO's logic was, he said, look, it's a horrible time, but that still means eight out of every 10 customers who used to come in still come in, and we want them happier than ever, and we want a larger share of their business. And so happy, competent staff on the front line, the front selling line at retail is frankly more important than it ever was. You know, we'll cut the perks and we'll even cut the company Christmas party, uh, but we're going to redouble our effort where the you know where you really hit the coal face. And because you talk about in your book, you talk about uh, brand and experiences, and that's exactly what you're talking about now, isn't it? Sort of you know the customer experience. Yeah. When they when they have a face to face with your brand, you can't cut that. Abs absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And and that experience tends. I mean, my argument, and of course the experienced marketing guys, Gilmore and Pine, who wrote the first book on it, the experience is the brand. Uh, you can't get away with murder with a jillion dollar advertising campaign when the smell tends to start seeping out of the, you know, out of the individual transaction. But, you know, incidentally going back to your, to your earlier question of standouts, and we just did a piece of this piece on this book at our blog, I think the guy's name was George Whalen, and he did a book on the 25 great retailers, independent retailers. And they're these amazing places. They're, you know, the first one was in something called, I think, Fairfield, Ohio. And I don't even think they've heard of it in Cleveland and Toledo, relative, let, let alone Manchester, England. But uh, you know, this, is a, this is a Christmas ornament store, and they have something like 6,000 varieties of trimmings that have come from all over the world. And, People drive 500 miles, or probably like they did with that Mall of America in Minneapolis years ago, fly in from Tokyo to this place. But, you know, so that kind of standoutishness, you know, is entirely possible. Yeah, because the vast majority of CEOs out there in the marketplace are obviously of medium sized organizations, not of those giants. So, what other advice would you give to them, Tom? The German answer is phenomenally good work. Uh, you know, one of the companies we looked at, which is now a couple billion dollars in size, is one of their machine tool companies called Trumpf. And, you know, the answer to the Trumpf deal is they make better stuff than other guys. Or, per the standard view, but Seth certainly underscores it, uh, we did not cover these people, but their classic Mittelstand, it's a small company and in the world of movie production, and we've all either seen them or, or seen them on the telly or what have you, those shockingly complex robotic chairs that the cameramen use on the, you know, on the big movie scenes. Well, there are two companies, as I understand it, both German, that own somewhere in the neighborhood of 100% of that market. Now, if you and I were a bright young man, you're the bright young man, I was the, used to be bright young man perhaps, uh, would we take those guys on? Not unless we took leave of our entire senses, but it's owning a market like that. You know, the, I, I wrote in that, or, or wrote about it you know, years ago and did a little TV thing on a wonderful German Mittelstein, you know, sub Mittelstein company called Goldman Productions, and they had something like 12 employees and a 50% market share. And they made this weird chemical that goes into what's called through coloring in candles. And you know, the stuff they put on the outside of candles tends to phase. If you do it in through coloring, it doesn't fade. But, you know, but they're, they are de facto untouchable uh, because they're so good. Now, you know, the flip side of that is the iPod and the iPhone do not have a, have a half-life, even though it's Apple, which is a long way from infinite. And, and so, you know, it, but, but, but again, back to this other rant of the, 
of the of the uh, you know the, the the companies we never write about the extraordinary I mean let, let's go to where people really work the extraordinary 11 person accountancy in a town of 17,000 that is incredibly client conscious has very intelligent people they can own that market you know I was I was down in the south 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 part of New Zealand a couple of years ago and in for cargo and I actually published this picture and was just walking by a building of a little accountancy and then for cargo and I thought this is the economy this is what Seth is talking about albeit the problem is that neither Seth nor I nor you talk about these people or write about these people and I don't know a damn thing about them but you know there's a little office building in Infracargo and it was a sharp looking office building and I will bet you dollars to donuts that they have a hell of a market position so yeah. you know I, I agree with Seth but again in 90 percent of the economy it doesn't mean that you have to be Apple trying to whack somebody else or Shell trying to get the drop on Exxon or, or vice versa. One of the things that's quite refreshing actually on your website and in your books is that you believe innovation can be easy. So what do you mean by that? Well, let me tell you what I mean, what I do mean and what I don't mean. The parts that's quote unquote, that are quote unquote easy is stuff like tolerating people who are annoying within some limits rather than automatically throwing them out. I was reading a little recession story a, a while back and it said that some company that was required to cut staff had kind of, if you imagine a little empl an employee evaluation thing where everybody is graded one to five, they, uh, they took this as a great opportunity to get rid of their quote unquote problem employees. And a year or so later, they realized that they had also destroyed their engine of innovation. Uh, and so it's the problem employees, God bless them. And again, God bless them, as I said earlier, the, the irritable 28-year-olds in logistics who can't understand why this process is so awful. Because you, know, you look at a company like Dell, and, and leadership is as likely to come from a fabulous business process as from some sexy kind of product. And so our 27-year-old invisible guy in HR or purchasing, I mean, go back to the container store. You know, what if it was a 28-year-old in the 11-person training department in the container store, which you've never heard about, who had a fabulous new idea for a training course that he had picked up from somebody else, who, blah, 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 blah. He's, he's as important to the container store in his own fashion as whoever is the top designer at an Apple or, you know, in Armani world or, or what have you. A second way that I think is incredibly important, and I'm really stuck on this, is in every single thing you do, uh, you are what you eat, meaning you are who you hang out with, period. Uh, if all of your vendors are multi-billion dollar companies who are determined at all costs to have no road bumps in our relationship, they ain't going to push you. And for example, though it's hardly a perfect indicator, my comment, one, I wrote somewhere at one point, and I said, never deal with a vendor, if you can help it, who is not in the top 10% in their industry in R&D expenditure. Uh, and that's hardly a perfect indicator, but it's not the worst sort of indicator. Uh, Procter & Gamble that, that, uh, that, that, that defined what used to be called, I don't hear quite so much, the not invented here phenomenon, that is if we didn't do it, it's not real. Uh, A.G. Laffley, who is the relatively famous CEO at, at the moment, said that from now on, half of our new products will come from things we find outside. And so one of their most successful products, and I've forgotten the entire story, but somebody at P&G somehow or other found some fabulous product coming out of some relatively small company in Japan and turned it into a winner with the enormous distribution system. So it, you know, and, and the key case, uh, you know, uh, Gary Hamill, the business strategy guy, I, you know, I, I've said many times I'd give him a Nobel Prize for 
a single sentence that he uttered, most of which I won't be able to recall. But the, the, the sentence is, the bottleneck begin, the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. And he argues that the least diversity, probably in smaller enterprises as well as large one, happens at the top. And, you know, which is one of the reasons, but, but it's, it's who, yeah, and boards. God only knows if you're looking for a dull set of human beings, uh, you know, the boardroom is probably the, you know, the best place to begin. And so the other thing, and we now have a, a rather enormous literature that supports that, in addition to saying variety of consultants, variety of people on the payroll, variety of vendors, uh, variety of locations, great innovation tends not to come within 100 miles of a corporate headquarters. I remember years ago, I was fascinated that kind of all the intriguing innovation in big companies came from a small lab outside of Madrid or I remember in the case of American companies, including IBM. Why the hell is it that all their best units came from Canada? And the answer is far enough away from home and speaking another language, uh, you know, and, and, and things like that. My lowercase d diversity is I don't care what the project is all over the map diversity, by which I mean left-handers, right-handers, particularly, and the British are worse than the Americans on this, uh, non-university people versus university people, and if it's university people, they really don't all have to have gone to Oxford, Cambridge, or Harvard, or Stanford, uh, but any mix, you know, any, 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 anything that, that constitutes mix and diversity helps, and God knows there are, you know, there are particularly in sizable firms, it's, you know, we may, we may do our gender thing, which of course I think is incredibly important, or we may do our uh, skin color thing, which I think is important on many dimensions, but I'm talking about something way, way, way beyond that. Because if you do the gender thing, you can also hire women who all graduated from Oxford, Cambridge, Stanford, or Harvard. And frankly, it's some of those dimensions that are a hell of a lot more important than the, than the standard uh, indices or indicators of diversity. It's interesting because you say in your book that if you hang out with dull people, thou shalt become more dull. Yeah, well, I mean, one of my favorite things that I remember very well, I was, I was doing, God alone knows why, maybe because of that, doesn't really know but knows a little, uh, some, some uh, predictive economic report years ago. And I was on a panel with the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Federal Express, Fred Smith. And I've known Fred for a while. And, and so amongst the little chit chat as we were in the green room, I remember he turned to me at one point and it was almost like being shot at. He said, okay, he said, who's the most interesting person that you've met in the last 90 days and how do I get a hold of them? And I thought, bloody brilliant, you know, literally and, and, and and you could argue they're so enormous now that it's not quite the case, FedEx consistently was doing stuff a little bit before other people were. Uh, com not forgetting your original question, uh, you do all these things and you're still a long way from home free in innovation, to put it mildly. But if you don't do these things, you're doomed. Uh, you know, another piece of it, which is far harder, uh, take an area about which I have great passion, which is the power of superb design. A company does not become design focused if they spend two and a half million dollars and hire a famous designer. It eventually has got to become embedded in the culture of the place as it is at a, you know, at a place like Apple. I mean, Motorola, for example, had its razor and it was great design, but it was de facto flash in the pan. And, uh, you know, it's not, not deeply embedded the way it is at, at uh, you know, some of the great design places from an Apple in an obvious way or a, or a Starbucks, frankly, in the way they create their sensory experiences. Tom, some people are still fixated on Kaizen and slow, continuous improvement, but I understand that those companies that are focused still on that and incrementalism a doomed. I did one time see an analysis, I've never seen another one and I'm not interested enough to follow it up, that said that superior long-term performance has a performance line with a high standard deviation. 
and this is really re relative to Kaizen, it says the performance goes like this. It saw teeth and the, and the survivor, but way below this person, is the person who gives you precisely the same earnings increase every year, year in and year out. Uh, there was a chemical company in the Bay Area called Raychem, and they were the masters of that. They would take this wacky project and that wacky pro project and wacky project A would bring them near bankruptcy. Then, in fact, they would have a phenomenal project that took them off into the universe, and they'd take, have another bad one, and they went down, but not as far as they had before. And so they literally grew like that. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense because nobody, uh, you know, nobody, to use American baseball, as I all too frequently do, nobody hits a home run all the time or even half the time. I think the MBA ought to be called the Master of Business Arts instead of the Master of, of Business Administration because business is pure art. Uh, I had a chapter title in my 1992 book, Liberation Management, and it said, damned if you do, damned if you don't, just plain damned. In order to master a market, you have to be consistent, and the moment you're consistent, you're vulnerable to attacks from the outside and it, it, it is just as simple as that. Uh, you know, to, to deliver the goods, to deliver them regularly, you've got to you know, be absolutely have laser-like focus, and laser-like focus means you're not hiring the innovative vendor. And, and you know, the cheap answer, which is the wrong answer, is do both. Of course you do, to some extent. But I remember reading about Dell when they started to get into trouble a couple years ago, and it said the entire reward system was focused on the guy who made a little tweak to the distribution system. Now, let me be entirely clear. We should all have Dell's problems. They changed the world with their business model, and they were wildly successful for 20 years, so God bless them. On the other hand, the odds of being the big innovator uh, for the next two generations are pretty damn low, I would argue. I mean, one of, the, one of the areas, Jim Collins and I agree on a lot of stuff and disagree on a lot of stuff, and one of the areas we really disagree on is I am appalled by the notion of built to last. Uh, you know, my bias is built to change the world and get 20 good years and it's great for America and great for the shareholders and you know long runs on Broadway are fine but runs that are too long aren't. GM, I'm thrilled with GM you know as an American they gave us you know they weren't really a powerhouse in a, in a way they were they were good but not a powerhouse until the end of World War II so let's say they they were beating the heck out of the world by the time you know we'd come back and we, it was a lot easier for us than you say 52 or 53, and then the Japanese began to challenge them in the late 70s and challenged them significantly by the early 80s. So we got 30 fabulous years out of GM. Let us applaud and send them politely on their way, which, you know, let me not be glib. I've got incredible empathy for the 54-year-old GM guy who knows nothing but GM whose pension was just canceled out of bankruptcy. And, and I acknowledge the, the god-awful mess associated with that. On the other hand, thanks, but I'm delighted that the Japanese were smart enough to build their transplants in the United States. And, you know, they may practice Kaizen, but relative to their overall practices, relative to our old car companies, that wasn't Kaizen, my friend. That was, you know, that was, that was disruptive innovation, to you know, quote Clay Christensen. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I said to somebody one time, they said, who's your favorite company in the world? And I said, Netscape. Born, changed the world, and died within 72 months. And then my question is, who the hell would you rather work for during that 72-month period, Netscape or the Bank of America? or Barclays right. to be a little right. closer yeah, to home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You sometimes say that sports managers get it right when it comes to talent, and very often business managers get it so wrong. Can you just give us a minute on that? There are, as you know, as I know, as any sports fan knows, or any symphony fan knows, there are 
extraordinary uh, music directors who are able to find extraordinary talent and spot young talent. In the world of sport, I mean, the, the American term tends to be general manager, the person who's not the coach on the field but is responsible uh, with the assistance of the coach for developing the, the, the talent pool. The, the real point I'm making is actually a lot simpler. Uh, by definition, it's a constrained world where there are as many wins collectively as losses. But there is no issue in sport whatsoever that you are not dependent on the quality of the stadium as much as that gives the owner a shot of money for five or ten years until the losses mount up. You are dependent on the quality of the team that's on the field, period. Uh, nobody said, you know, the, the, the shocking phrase often in the world of big business, people matter, is not a phrase that would exactly you know, be one that would be written down by the guy who owns the Oakland A's or the San Francisco Giants or what have you. They know it's talent. And when a baseball book that's uh, written that is famous, which is rare, in America it was going to be a movie, uh, it was a book called Moneyball, and it was about a guy who was the talent collector, general manager at a team called the Oakland A's, which has one of the lowest payrolls out of 30 teams and one of the best records. And he had just developed a truly new way of, of, of selecting and developing talent. So, you know, the, as I say, the point is very simple. It's if you're a symphony conductor, you may be the most creative guy in the world, but you damn well better have a talented first violinist, period, all stop. Talent is it. The roster is it. Because there seems to be one underlying theme, Tom, to everything, and that is that you're a massive believer in that organizations need to be focused on talent and human development. I'm rants. I have become radical beyond radical on this topic. I, it, the, the, the occasion was, was something in, in Sydney that was a, a celebration of Peter Drucker's life's work. But I wrote this thing and I said, an organization must be a cathedral devoted to human development. And, and I believe it. And I'm really pushing people hard on it. The, the service to the customer comes entirely as a focus of the energy, enthusiasm, and attitude, not only of the person who meets you at the reception desk, but also the accountant who helps you with a credit card that's rejected, or debit card if you are outside of the United States, uh, or, or what have you. There's a, there are a couple of Swedes who wrote a book that I love. I get very turned on by books that have great titles, whether I like the inside or not. And the book was called Hostmanship, H-O-S-T-M-A-N-S-H-I-P. And he said the leader is the host to his or her employees. And these guys, the two authors, I think bought a hotel at one point, and they said our first effort was to go through the hotel and try to transform it. What does that mean? We didn't try to transform the rooms. We transformed staff cafeterias, we transformed uniforms, we transformed trainers, and then he asked this rhetorical question, and he said, what hotel would you rather stay at? The one that has a totally engaged, turned on staff, or the one that's absolutely gorgeous, and has a staff that only knows one word, and the word is snarl. And, uh, and, and so I, I'm, you know, the, the, the and then I, I don't like the 100-page large print parable books, just between you and me in this private conversation we're having in the pub. Uh, but I read this one that this guy Matthew Kelly wrote that was called The Dream Manager. And it's a trivial point that's profound. He said everybody has a dream and if you can help them enable that dream, biz business related or not, you will have helped create an energetic person. And I thought of it, it's true here too, but well certainly true in places like London, it's true more maybe even in the US. The frontline employee 
whose life is far more interesting than yours or mine and complicated is an uh, immigrant from Ecuador who has become a single mom who has two kids that she's raising uh, with a limited education, blah, 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 blah. If you can help her at the margin, uh, you know, we, we have a two-year college degree that you tend to call things like an associate degree. We call the whole phenomenon junior college. You get a degree. If you can help her a, achieve a junior college certificate, which will change her long-term trajectory, what I'm betting, any sum of money you choose to name, is you will have a very engaged person working in your kitchen or housekeeping department or what have you. And, and he argues that the role of the leader is to be a dream enabler. You know, I mean, at some level you could go off into the sky on this and, you know, we would both start choking, tossing our lunch or breakfast as the case may be. But the fundamental notion is right on the money. And, uh, and I just, I had, you know, I had never seen the language and I really, really fell in love with it. I mean, the, the guy who really introduced me to it is a fellow by the name of Hal Rosenbluth. He inherited a little family travel company in Philadelphia called Rosenbluth. He turned it into Rosenbluth International, which became a shockingly effective organization, and he sold it to American Express for billions literally a couple years ago. But Hal wrote a book, and this is the way he lived, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago, that was called Putting the Customer Second. And Hal, being a very earthy guy, I've forgotten the subtitle, but it was something like, put your employees first and kick butt in the marketplace, right. just straight out. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, to, to, to butcher the language that you and I don't share called American English, uh, you know, the, the storyline is, if you really want to put your customer first, you have to put the employee who serves the customer more first. And, you know, it is an abuse of the language, but I think it's also, you know, rather clear. So, um, the, the Southwest guy, incidentally, Herb Kelleher was the, the, and he has a one, you know, apparently whenever anybody asked Kelleher, how did you do this miracle at Southwest? He said, I treated my employees as my most important customers. Uh, and that's the term he uses. He uses the term customer. Tom, I love the fact that you just follow, you know, your heart. Whatever you think is cool, you'll then explore and then you'll get curious about it and you'll get passionate about it. What advice would you give to somebody that's watching this that's thinking, I'm not particularly surrounded by passion in, in what I'm doing. What advice would you give to them to go, go and find their passion? Let me come at it from exactly the opposite way, which happens to be consistent with something I wrote two days ago. Uh, and I wrote it rude and I said it was rude and it was, it was exactly related to your, to your question. I, I said a lot of people criticize me for using words like wow a lot. And given my age and you know, observations of humanity associated therewith, I will be the first one to acknowledge that there are such things as shitty days at the office and shitty weeks and <laughs> shitty months and so on. Um, but I said, let's look at it another way, which is you know, more, uh, more important to a 66-year-old than a 26-year-old, though I don't really think it's the case. I said, if it's true, and I'm not going to take you through the math because we don't have the time, if the average person gets up around 6, you know, once you get out of your 20s, 6.30 in the morning and goes to bed at 11 o'clock at night, you're awake for 17 hours and Two or three of those hours is spent doing crap like a commute and so on, and that's irreducible fundamentally. So you're left with 14 hours, and you know there are some jobs where you work 9 to 5, but not that many of us. Let's just say that you work from 8.30 to 5.30. Uh, you're fundamentally alert for 14 hours a day, and nine of those hours are spent at work. And my punchline is if you piss away the work hours, you have quantitatively pissed away your life. I am delighted that your children and your spouse come before your work. Uh, but I'm still right. Nine fourteenths of the day is spent at work and if you spend the day, you know, Dilbert is hilarious, but I hate it because of pure, raw, unmitigated cynicism. Uh, he's right, the situations are described right, we've all dealt with those kinds of situations, but it's your life. 
Tom, some management gurus focus on just one or two things, but I guess you're known for being adaptive. In other words, whatever is hot right now or in, indeed on the horizon, that's what you're focusing on. So can you just tell me, is there one reoccurring or consistent strand to all of your teachings? I really think some of the themes like the action orientation and the people thing have stayed there as the bedrock to the bedrock. But the, you know, the, the, you know there, there, there are two directions to taking in, in giving the answer. Somebody was an interview actually in Vanity Fair and, and somebody asked Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, a question and he said, I think my number one attribute is being curious. Uh, you know, I owe it all to my mother. She turned me into a reader by the age of four and a half, and there's nothing. There's nothing that I'm not interested in, and and uh, you know, I, I have unfairly sometimes compared sometimes compared myself to the strategy guru Michael Porter, and said fundamentally Michael is a deductive thinker. He sits in a tower, which is not true, but he thinks a lot and creates frameworks. If I go my entire life without a framework, I will be thrilled, even though I'm a German who was trained as an engineer and worked at McKinsey. Uh, <laughs> I get passions for something, and I don't give a damn whether it fits in a framework. The guy who used to do the management column at the Financial Times was a guy by the name of Chris Lorenz. And long before it became popular, like 81 or 82 or 83, and he was a big figure over here, became fascinated by industrial design. Well, Chris was a pal, and I got turned on by what got him turned on. I am the least artistic person God ever put on the world. And also, incidentally, I was working with Apple as a consultant way back in 81 and 82, but it, went, it was one of those. And I thought, this is cool. And so I chased it, and I got turned on by it, and I'm, you know, I talk loudly. And so you know, a few people listened, and, and it became you know, same deal. Uh, you know, if we had hours instead of minutes, I would talk to you about the reason I've gone after this marketing to women, women as leadership with a total passion for the last 13 years. And it came out of one meeting that was called by the woman who ran my training uh, company back in 96. And I was just stunned by what I was hearing. You know, it was a meeting with a bunch of phenomenally competent professional women who own companies and also the woman who was the first Indy 500 female driver and so on. And they spent three hours, no pain, no passion, no tears, talking about the way nobody served women's needs in the marketplace and the average provider of services or products, doctors and lawyers and financial advisors, let alone car salesmen, treated them as brainless individuals. And so it just, it turned me on. And so I spent 13 years on the topic. You know, I think if we had enough time, I could construct some convoluted chain that would take it back to somewhere else, but I did it because I thought it was cool. <laughs> awesome. and, and back to your very first question about pissing me off, I fall in love with things that to not do them is stupid. You know, I'm not interested in the women's thing because of social justice, or if I am, it's my own political views that are none of your business, and that's what I practice in my private half. I'm interested in it because women buy everything, and male-dominated product development, marketing, and boards pay no attention to them. There's a term for that. Stupid, idiotic, insane, brainless. And the same thing is true with the design stuff. And, you know, three or four areas that I have indeed gone off on these multi-year rants. It's, you know, the, somebody said, why are you interested in design? And I said, because I think cool things are cooler than things that aren't cool. And I think that you can have cool things that cost $3.75 as well as iPods and Apple computers. And I featured at my website a while back something that's called the Tough Enough Hammer. And it's a little gorgeous hammer, but it has a handle that's only that long, but the same heavy, exact same weight. So for those little tasks, which some of us occasionally do, where you don't have any space for a handle that's that long, you lose some of the leverage. I understand that. I was trained as an engineer. Uh, but it's a gorgeous, it's a, you know, it's a work of art, works brilliantly. And it's cool, and you don't have to go to Neiman Marcus or Tiffany to buy the damn thing. Yeah, because you also say, I understand, that it's, you can be passionate about design and not necessarily work for Porsche or Bugatti. 
but rather even if you're in charge of an accounts payable department or a Six Sigma department of 12, 13 people, you can still be passionate about design. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, there is no place where, well, to look at that coming at it in a reverse way, I own an office building in Palo Alto, actually the only good decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> uh, and, and my tenant is BMW. Uh, and it, it's, it's their Silicon Valley outpost. BMW spent ridiculous amounts of money on, and the lease may or may not last forever, they actually signed a five or 10 year lease on redoing this 2,500 square feet, which is what, uh, 170 me square meter space, because their buildings and their offices look like their cars. And it's you know, consistent all the way through. And if you were a software vendor uh, excited about working with BMW, would you be excited about going into a trashy building? And, and their theory is if you want to work with BMW, it's because you're, you know, you're sucked into the sexy aura of the whole place. And, it's, and, and so I think, it's, you know, I think that's critical. It is calling. It's business processes. I, I was listening. This guy went to a con conference a while back. And I think, I, well, I know I'm directionally right, and I think I'm actually exactly right. The mayor of Lisbon spoke, and as is true in a lot of places and in, well, bureaucratic nations, find one that's not. The, the licensing of a small business had taken 17 departments in 17 weeks, and that's not accurate. Actually, it's probably worse, but he reduced it to a 15-minute process that was all done online. Now, that's design. That's beauty, uh, at least as much as anything that's ever come out of Apple. You know, I read Business Week and Forbes and The Economist, but some of the coolest stuff that I run across is if I'm giving a tra trade show speech to the International Dairy, Deli, and Bakery Association, uh, I read their journal. And they t their journal has more good stuff on, quote, experience marketing than the last 20 years of Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, Inc., Fast Company, and the Wall Street Journal combined. I mean, that's where you find it, some you know, guy doing a deli in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Yeah. And so, point being that those stories uh, are available to all of us. There was a guy in, a, you know, in, in uh, Watsonville, California, there's a company called Granite Rock Company. They are aptly named. They do asphalt, concrete, road rock, dullest stuff in the world, and the highest level quality award in the United States is something called the Baldrige Award. They won one. I had the best customer training experience, teaching training, at that company that I've had anywhere. And these are guys who drive concrete mixers. The guy who runs the company had asked people to prep for my two-hour seminar. And he said, over the next two weeks, I want you to record the best and worst service experiences you have in life. A dirty washroom, restroom at a movie theater, a great little exchange with somebody who returns your dry cleaning, and all the other things that are part of life. And so we spent two hours translating the laundromat experience to the world of delivering concrete. Now the point relative to your question, and again, so I'm not driving a concrete truck, I'm a, I'm a cipher in the purchasing department at an insurance company. I'll bet you can do the same deal that from life life you can come up with 25 ideas that would you know take a project and twist it this way or that and potentially make it exciting. Uh, so you know if you're curious, if you read, if you pay attention to what's around you, uh, life is a learning experience that can be translated and you know, then when you do this little stuff, uh, it's, it can turn on others. If I tell you that what I've, and you're my boss or even my peer, but you've been around longer, if I tell you that the way this process works is really stupid, that's not going to turn you on. 
Well, one of the classic cases, oddly enough, the, one of the best-run health care system in America is the Veterans Administration. And among other things, they went to the electronic uh, medical records thing earlier than others. You know where it came from? There was this guy who was like the number two guy in the Veterans Administration hospital system, and he was out uh, visiting a Veterans Administration hospital, and this woman who was a you know, lower level employee, I don't know if she's a nurse's aide or something like that, he was doing his managing by wandering around MBWA bit, and he was talking to her, and she said to him, she said, you know, I was just in Burger King, and why can't we scan stuff the way they do? You know, light bulb goes off five years later, back to an earlier question of yours, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of hard work, uh, the VA within the context of American health care is leading the world. And it's a woman who said, why can't we do Burger King in the hospital? And, you know, so the, so, you know, yeah. the wow is available if we just pay attention. I mean, you know, they, again, like everything easier said than done. The, you know, I think the, the, the textbook definition of creativity is people who bring experiences from one place into another place with some degree of ease. They aren't necessarily the people who have the highest IQs, but they are the people who deal comfortably with the largest and highest standard deviation database to some extent. Right. But at least we can get it to the point where you're the boss and you're and you're you're running a housekeeping department and you say to your group of people, you say, come on, you do a hundred things a week. You know, you know, bring me a cool idea. Coolest idea at next week's meeting gets a $50 gift certificate uh, to obesity world, <laughs> the fast food environment. But why not? Yeah. And you know, you'll have people killing themselves to bring in a good idea. And in that housekeeping department, a $50 gift certificate to Walmart, where you can buy anything in the world, that, that ain't no small deal, and particularly in a difficult time. Tom Peters, it's been phenomenal to have you here. I've read your books, I've listened to your CDs, I've watched you speak live, and now I've spent an hour sitting in front of you. I can at last retire. Well, except for the fact that I've got the small issue of money still, but you know. I know the feeling. It's been an honor to have you with us here on Bevo. I can't even begin to tell you how delighted we are when you said yes, and now you've done a phenomenal interview with us, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Thank it's, you, sir, it's, much. it's great fun. There are. Uh, Per our last piece of our conversation, there are good interviews and bad interviews. There are well-prepared interviewers and not so well-prepared interviewers. And so in the same vein, uh, we wouldn't have spent this amount of time together if it wasn't a hell of a lot of fun. So thank you for the energy, effort, professionalism, and, and et cetera. Bevo.com.